new accessibility police. All right. All right. We are officially <laughs> recording. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to all of you for attending and being here today. I also especially wanted to extend my gratitude to our panelists, uh, Ben, Dawn, and Lissy for uh, volunteering. They're not getting paid for this. They're not getting any kudos. You know, they're just, they, they wanted to um, sort of be a part of this conversation. So uh, thanks to all of you, especially the panelists. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Tim Henningsen. I'm the chair of the college's instruction committee. Um, our committee is, uh, we're, we're charged with, we are a, a, an elected committee of full-time faculty and we're charged with overseeing the um, sort of the pedagogical integrity of the um, teaching and learning at the college. And so um, we work with a variety of constituents across campus and usually tend to, to solve a lot of problems related to teaching, um, systems, um, just student-based issues. And uh, traditionally we've been a very, I think, reactive committee, but in the last couple of years we've tried to um, be a little more proactive in these faculty panels that we facilitate uh, a variety of times every semester is one of the reasons um, that sort of exemplifies our attempts to just try and get people together to have conversations about good teaching, about pedagogy, about um, online quality, which is why we're all here today. So um, there has been some conversations, I think in pockets across the college about how you define uh, quality online teaching and learning. Um, but as we see it, this is maybe the first opportunity to get a wide variety of people from a variety of places across campus together in a room to talk about this. So um, and the, one of the other motives for us scheduling these panels is um, you've probably seen the proliferation of these online quality rubrics. Um, a variety of colleges have them and they basically use these rubrics to apply to a, a college level class to try and determine does it meet the certain quality criteria that you know whatever that organization or institution has um, determined. But one of the, in our committee, instruction has had a lot of conversations about this and we sort of found that these rubrics never quite um, work across as an entire uh, umbrella. That's not the right, the right way I wanted to really put it necessarily, but um, we sort of feel at least our, it's our committee's philosophy that um, online quality means different things to different departments in different divisions. And so that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this. We wanted to get um, faculty that share the same division together to talk about what online quality means to them in their particular department or discipline. And so that's why we've tried to organize, organize these panels by, um, by division and have different representatives from the different disciplines come and talk about what it means to sort of um, contemplate online quality in their particular field. So that's our purpose today. Um, as with all instruction faculty panels, each of the panelists will have about 10 minutes to be able to address that uh, topic. So we're gonna start off with Lissy and then we're gonna do, uh, Dawn will uh, go second and then Ben uh, will uh, close things for us. And um, after that, we'll have a general Q&A. So I would ask all of you to be on your best Zoom behavior, mute your mics if you're coming in here. Um, if you have questions, you're welcome to post them in the chat, but it's, it's usually helpful to wait to, to do that until the panelists are done so that they're not distracted by comments on the side. So once, um, once the panelists are done, I'll open the floor and we'll have some uh, conversations about um, you know, some of the things they said and how we define online quality in our, in our own particular areas. So without further ado, Lissy Maris is going to go first. Lissy, thank you for being here. I will uh, pass the, um, the torch over to you and you're welcome to uh, kick things off for us. All right, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> okay. Okay. <laughs> Wow, you could see my notes. Can you see my notes? It's okay. Okay, you can't. <laughs> All right, um, one second, let me just adjust this. Uh, there we go. Okay, so thank you instruction committee for inviting me to share my tips for online teaching. I wanted to also thank my fellow panelists. I look forward to learning from you today. Um, before I start this talk, I wanted to take a moment to show my support for the Black Lives Matter movement and dedicate this presentation to all of our brothers and sisters that have lost their lives due to police brutality. Um, they are not forgotten. Okay, so I believe we see a lot of racial tension and division in our country and around the world because societies keep othering people or cultures distinct from their own. The focus um, is usually on differences versus similarities. So I thought to myself, what could we as instructors do in our online classes to build bridges between diverse cultures? 
My solution was to incorporate virtual opportunities for students to develop their intercultural competence skills. So how do I do this? Number one, I don't treat culture as an add-on or a factoid. This still, this still puts culture in a quote unquote other category. Instead, I use my students' own culture as a base point to explore someone else's culture and their way of life. This way students find more similarities than differences and build connections through those. So how have I done this in my online classes? Um, I invited CCI students from Colombia studying at College of DuPage to my online classes. Their names are Santiago and Alejandro. Santi and Alejo shared how academic life is in Colombia pre and post COVID with my students. Then my students describe academic life at COD pre and post COVID. The conversation was interesting and intriguing. Both Alejo and Santi and my students were able to compare and contrast their academic lives and found that yes, there were some differences, but there were also similarities that united them. During this exchange of ideas, my students were able to not only practice their listening and speaking skills in Spanish, they were able to learn about Santiago and Alejandro's academic life in Colombia. Another example of how I add or plan to add even more opportunities to develop students' interculturality is through a language exchange pilot program called Talk Abroad. Associate Professor of German, Miglena Nikolova, and I just submitted a national grant application for the Talk Abroad program that will allow our students to connect with native speakers of Spanish or German around the world virtually. Our goal is for our students to develop their listening and speaking skills in Spanish and German while discussing relevant and meaningful topics, which will also build our students' intercultural competence skills. Here is a video of what the language exchange will look like for our students if we get approved. Sí, sí. Sí, correcto. Yo vivo en, en Guatemala, en el país de Guatemala y la ciudad de Guatemala. Vivo en la capital de mi país y tiene el mismo nombre. Guatemala, ciudad de Guatemala. Es igual. Wow, yeah. Y uh, por qué te gusta de vivir en Guatemala, en Guatemala ciudad? <laughs> Me gusta porque es una ciudad grande, hay, hay muchas actividades que hacer, muchos lugares hermosos que conocer, el tráfico eh, es muy malo, es terrible, pero, pero en general es una ciudad con muchas oportunidades y muchas cosas que hacer. ¿Y a ti te gusta tu ciudad? Sí, me gusta Fort Lauderdale. Um, uh, Vivo cerca de las playas. Were you all able to hear that? Yes, okay. Um, so in this clip, you could see the student and her conversation partner discussing their own cities. They both love aspects of their cities and they explain why, but they also get to learn about each other's cities and where they live. What do these cities have in common? What do they like about their partner's city? By having students participate in virtual language exchanges such as this one or the one with Santiago and Alejandro, students are learning about someone else's culture firsthand and feeling more connected to that culture or person persons of that culture. As a result, the otherizing dissipates while connections begin to form. The video I just showed you was shown without YouTube ads, which we've probably all experienced. And um, at the exact spot, I wanted the language exchange to start. How did I do this? If you put a hyphen right after the T in the YouTube link you want to share with your online class, this will get rid of the ads. Um, if you right click on the YouTube video you would like to use in your classes, it will give you an option to copy the code at the exact spot you want the video to start. We've heard a lot of complaints about TikTok. <laughs> the most used social media app today. I personally don't have a TikTok account because when I did, I all of a sudden started getting calls from China. However, I can still watch TikTok videos as an observer without an account. I use TikTok to learn technology tips for my online classes. For example, I learned these YouTube tricks from scrolling through TikTok. 
I also use TikTok to explore cultural videos from Spanish speaking countries, and I share them with my students in my online classes. For example, most of my students didn't know that we have Afro Latino communities all over the world that speak Spanish. I could use TikTok to explore these communities and share parts of their daily lives with my students. Let's see an example. Whoa, check that out. As part of our discussion in class or in groups, I focus my lesson plan on similarities versus differences. What are traditional meals you eat in your family? Are they similar or different from what the Afro Latina mom in the TikTok video served? Would you like to try her dish? Why or why not? The Afro Latino communities are marginalized in Latin America. Do you feel our African American communities in the US are also marginalized? What are some examples of marginalization you see in the video or in your own cities? So here's an example of how I use TikTok to develop my students' interculturality. How do we bring our students closer to Latinx culture or other diverse communities? My final tip for you is to create community with a capital C for your online classes. Students could feel very isolated in the virtual environment. So why not create community outside of the online classroom? I do this by helping Casa de Amigos, the Spanish club, organize virtual events twice a month. I'm also involved in committees on campus that promote cultural virtual events for students and community members as well. Pre-COVID, Casa de Amigos and the Latin American Studies Committee would host an annual salsa merengue bachata dance on campus. This is what it looked like. <laughs> So fun. We cannot have the dance on campus this year due to COVID, but we didn't want to miss the opportunity for students, faculty, and staff, and community members to connect. So this year, our Salsa Merengue Bachata dance will be virtual. Here's the flyer, which we will share campus wide again. Um, Casa de Amigos is also going to be hosting a virtual movie night with the Native American Studies Committee in the next few weeks. There will be an announcement for that soon. These extracurricular events at College of DuPage build a sense of community outside of our online classes. And they are meaningful for students because they invite them to explore and experience diverse cultures. I wanted to end this presentation by saying, you got this. It's an expression my nephew uses often. We are all trying our best to do what we can to improve our online instruction. I myself am learning a lot from these sessions. So thank you again, instruction committee and colleagues for sharing this journey with me. I will leave you with a message from Big Sean, the first rapper to ever be invited to perform at the White House. He shares a sentiment I have about online instruction and life in general. We will have good days and bad days, but we're in this together. No, uh, there's something on your mind that you're like, oh, I feel like I need to share this with people. Well, I do want to just share that I go through terrible days. I go through dark moments. I go through great days. I have great moments. And, you know, it's not like I figured life out. I, you know, I, I don't think anyone on this earth has ever figured life out all the way. Agreed. And I don't think it's for us to to figure out. You know, I, maybe there are other purposes for it, but I just want to put that out there and say that, you know, you're not alone. Like whoever, you know, whoever needs to hear that, like you just, you're not alone. You know, obviously Jay Shetty got you. I got like, we're all in this together. Yeah. And, but, you know, I just want to, I just want to end on that and just say that thank you. Thank you guys for listening you know, to anybody who needed to hear this, like I needed to hear myself, you know, everything I said is because I, it was on my heart that needed to be expressed for you and for myself and mm. for, for whatever other reason. So thank you. That is a And so thank you.
which is gracias. I hope at least one of my tips will serve as a resource for you. If you have any questions or if you feel like you'd like to connect, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I left my email there. And that's it. Lissy, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, great way to kick things off today. So Dawn, are you re ready? I am. Uh, All right, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Dawn Chow. I teach in the philosophy and religious studies department. I teach philosophy. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mainly talk to you today about um, my asynchronous online course that I taught this past summer. So I think, um, you know, my goal when I teach philosophy classes is to teach students how to think like a philosopher. And like whether the, 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 the sort of the content to me is less important. What I want them to learn is these key skills of, you know, analyzing arguments into premises and conclusions, analyzing whether the conclusion follows from the premises, learning to define their terms clearly um, and to track definitions that others have given, make distinctions, evaluate strengths and weaknesses of arguments, things like that. Those are the skills I want students to get. Um, however, in order for them to be able to even practice those activities, you know, so, so like one thing is they need to be actively practicing those skills. They can't just be passively sitting back and listening to a lecture or they're not gonna learn the skills. You only learn them by doing them. But at the same time, in order for them to be able to practice those skills, they need to have, they need to be able to tell what's going on. And that can be a problem in philosophy. Um, so obviously you can't just give students Rene Descartes and expect them to read that and understand it. Um, uh, but it's, it, you also can't necessarily, in my experience, give them a textbook, a modern textbook of, on philosophy and expect them to read that and understand it. Um, uh, students, you know, it's one of my goals for a class that by the end of the class, maybe they'd be able to read the textbook and understand it, but they tend to have a really hard time with philosophical arguments um, because they don't have those skills yet. And so when I first um, had to tackle this task of teaching online in an asynchronous format, I was like, how am I going to do this? So if I just give them some readings, they're not going to get the readings. And in class, you know, in a face-to-face -face class, the way you do is you come in, you explain the argument, they misunderstand the argument. And you say, aha, that is an excellent misunderstanding. Let me explain why that's not quite right. And then you do it a few times and then gradually light dawns. And that process is how they learn to process the text and to process the ideas more effectively. It's this dialogic process. And I have to convert that into an asynchronous format where the dialogue is not so much happening. So how to do that? So I'm gonna share with you a few things that I did that I think kind of worked. Um, in the end, I, I taught the class for the first time this summer. So I'm still learning, it's a, it's a process. Um, can we see, can we see the screen? Can we see my, Oh, okay, um, so so it is definitely a process, but I have to say that as of at the end of the semester, um, my students, uh, based on their assignments and on how they performed in papers and how they were performing in uh, discussion in discussions on the discussion board, they seem to be doing actually even a little bit better than my face-to-face -face students usually are. They seem to be getting the concepts. They seem to be understanding the arguments. They seem to be having the showing the skills. So. What are my tips what, that I think got that outcome? Um, one thing I would say is I think it's really important in an online course to make sure that it's super, super clearly laid out, that the um, expectations are super, super clear and that everything is really, really easy to find. And that's true in all classes, but it's especially true in an online class, I think, because you know, the barrier for asking you questions is higher. So they're not gonna ask you questions as often if they can't find something, they might just not find it and not do it. Um, and you don't have as many opportunities to remind them of things. So um, one thing I did is in our week one introduction, I had this introduction to the course, which was an hour long. I, I said it was, a, it's not an hour long video, but I said it would take about an hour. So it has like a, a welcome video. Um, I'll make that a little bit smaller. Um, I included a video tour of the Blackboard site so they would know where they were going to go for everything. And I emailed them a link to that. Um, and then I also gave them a clear schedule where, you know, they knew what was going to be due every week and there's like set deadlines every week. 
Um, and also just generally um, making it really easily laid out. So the bulk of the, the work in the class is laid out in these weekly learning modules. I think I got this from uh, Jen, <laughs> Jen Kelly, uh, but uh, you know, so each week's assignments are laid out in a, a separate folder. And then within that week's folder, they're in these little chunks. So um, relatedly, I think it's really important to have a, a repeated schedule so that things are due the same days each week so they can get used to it and they won't forget. Um, then the other thing that I think really worked is um, how I laid out these learning modules. So um, for example, this would be one week of work in an eight week class. So it's, it's um, uh, two weeks of a 60 week class. Um, they had to spend some time learning how to analyze arguments into premises and conclusions. And so I would give them a video that they had to watch, and then they had a question that they had to answer. So like a question, you know, it's an assignment that'll take me five seconds to grade. Then another video, and then another really basic comprehension question, comprehension check question. Then another video, then something to read, then some practice exercises, and then an exercise they'd submit for credit. So the idea is that when students go to do their weekly assignments, they're just going to go into each folder and then they just the things they need to do are in order. And so each each bit, you know, they're building up on their understanding. They're just going to progress through the exercises in order. Um, so when I first did this, I was a little worried that students would find this overwhelming. It's like, holy cow, this looks like so much work. Um, but I actually got really positive responses. Um, when I surveyed students, they raved about the organization of the course. They said it was the best organized course they'd ever taken. They loved it. They loved that everything was really easy to find, really easy to see what they had to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I got very positive feedback. And as I said, students did seem to be learning. They did seem to be mastering the concepts. Um, so then, uh, let's see if I go back. Um, here's another section within that same week. Uh, or wait, no, let me pick a different one. Um, yeah, so here's another section within that same week. Um, I'm introducing an essay by W.K. Clifford. It's this famous philosophical essay that students will have a little bit of a hard time understanding. So I made one video, like a five to 10 minute video by me introducing the topic. Then they watched a YouTube video specifically about this essay, like a five minute YouTube video. Then they read the essay themselves. Then they had to answer a question based on the reading that they did, a question that would have been key to what I thought would be challenging for them to answer, but still doable. And then I had another video explaining deeper aspects of the reading that I expected they probably missed. So overall, what I tried to do in each week's materials um, was to vary things between videos and reading, back and forth, video, reading, video, reading. Um, and also to vary things between passive activities where they're just reading or listening and active activities where they're actively doing an assignment or they have to answer a question. And so the goal is always never to just let them be passive, but always make them be doing something to demonstrate that they've understood, doing something to actively practice the skills. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so just a, you know, a variety of activities so that if people learn better from videos, they're getting some of that. If they learn better from reading, they're getting some of that. Um, and things are broken up into these chunks that they can do one bit at a time. Um, and you can see uh, in, let's see. I'm totally failing to go back. Um, Within each section, I'll even say like how long it, it's supposed to take so that hopefully in theory, I don't think they usually do this, but in theory, they could like plan ahead and be like, okay, I'll do the first hour on Monday and the second bit on Tuesday. Um, but uh, so one thing that this meant is um, I had to use a lot of low stakes assignments, a lot more low stakes assignments that I would use in a face-to-face -face class. So in a face-to-face -face class, I would maybe have one or two small homework assignments per week. But in these classes, I'm having them do a lot of teeny tiny assignments, just, you know, like maybe answer a quick question in a sentence, answer a quick question in a paragraph um, to go along with all of these little teeny tiny things that they're supposed to watch and read. Um, and 
part of why I did that is just so that they have to watch the video. I figure if I don't give them an assignment, they might just skip the video. But more importantly than that, it's not just a matter of enforcement, but if you have them watch a five minute video and then answer a single sentence question, that's forcing them to synthesize the information that they just heard and they'll be more likely to remember it. Um, and so that's all an attempt to try as best I can to turn this process into a more dialogical process. Um, they're not getting the benefit of an actual in-class dialogue like they would have if they were in a face-to-face -face class, but they're working through the material in a way that does have some back and forth to it. Um, yeah, so I guess that's that's what I did, and I think it worked pretty well. That's Those are the, the, the tips that I have to share that um, students were really positive about. And one other, I guess, one other tiny point I would say is that um, Part of what made this system work is that I wasn't using a textbook, but I was instead using solely free or self-created um, materials. And so that's part of why I was able to just list everything in here. And one thing several students mentioned was that they really liked that they could just do all of the exercises within each page. They didn't have to look anything up in a textbook. They didn't have to go off someplace else. But that made it a lot easier. And almost all students did almost every assignment over the entire course of the semester, which was an, a new and strange experience to me. Um, so I think the fact that it was like clearly organized made students more likely to actually do everything. Um, okay, so that's what I had to share with you. Uh, thank you all. And let me see if I can get this. Uh, thank you, that was fantastic. And I sense that you're making some faculty a little envious given how organized and tidy your Blackboard shells are. So um, looks great, that was really helpful. Um, all right, last but certainly certainly not least, Ben. Oh, ben, hold up, you're muted, and we're going to get, um, if Dawn, if you can stop screen sharing and let Ben take over. I thought I did stop screen. Oh, wait, no. Uh, there we go. Ben, you want to try and share yours now? I'll try. Um, it does, it's not letting me. Oh, there it goes. Hold on. There went. Sorry. I'm still seeing Dawn's screen on my end. Me too. Let me try this. There we go. Now you now you should be able to do it, Ben. Sorry, I never knew. I never use Zoom. <laughs> no worries. All right. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, and thanks for showing up today, and thanks to the to the instruction committee for having us do this. Um, my approach to this is uh, what I thought I would do with this is do something a little bit different and look at something much more narrow, sort of one specific kind of assignment. And I'll get to that in one second. But one of the difficulties when we went to teaching a lot of our virtual classes was we had a discussion among history faculty a lot about how do you do this and how do you transfer any kind of elements from the classroom into VCM? So that was one of the big sort of debates. And some of us had more experience than others with teaching online. So it was, it was a lot of you know transition that took place a year ago uh, for, for a lot of us to, to do this. Um, one of the things that I like to do in my classes is have students directly engage with uh, primary source materials. And this is usually written materials. And this is sort of the, the lifeblood in many ways of, of history is that we look at these primary sources. And many years ago, I had adopted the practice in the regular classroom course of, you, of having students give short presentations on primary sources that we were reading for class. And this is not a unique kind of assignment, um, certainly. But what I did is I thought that's something I wanted to take with me into the into the VCM class. Um, I didn't bring everything I do in the classroom into the VCM, but that's one where I wanted students to engage and actually have to engage with their classmates. One of the frustrations that I've had for many years, going well before the pandemic, was getting students to engage with each other. And I usually mocked them pretty heavily in class when they would have a discussion and they wouldn't look at each other. They would always look at me. And I even sort of took to the practice of hiding behind the technology bunker in the classroom to see if they would actually look at each other. And the answer is they won't. Um, they still look at, at a blank front of the room. I've even walked out of the room sometimes during discussion, they keep looking at the door. So I don't know quite. So I was trying to find a way to get them to talk to each other. So this is true on, and it's even a little bit worse, obviously with doing a BCM class. So what, we, what, I, what I thought I would do is, is, is have students look at this. And the way I do it is, very simply in a course, and it depends on the course and it depends on, so this is a, what you see in front of you here is a, uh, it's an online reader from an American history survey class. And what it has is uh, a whole online textbook 
is, which is a different link. And what this is, are links to those chapters. And then if you look at one of them as an example, um, say uh, here, you will see that it goes to chapter 20. And the chapter 20 is about the progressive era at the end of the 19th, and beginning of the 20th century in America. And then it'll have primary source documents as you probably can see on your screen here numbered. And these are all links into primary sources. And so what I do, and it depends on the structure of the class, meaning how many students and sort of the content of the material, but every student is assigned at least, uh, at least one, more often two uh, primary source assignments. And what it is, it's a very simple thing. It, it requires no grading for me, which is always good. And that is where I assign students um, a document that we're going to discuss on a certain day. And I tell them this at the beginning of the semester, all the documents are assigned all the way through. And all they have to do to get credit for this is show up on the day that they're assigned and show evidence that they prepared the assignment. And they don't have to actually do well at it. What I'm trying to get them to do is to break down this barrier with the material um, because they get very nervous. And so before this assignment, a lot of students will start emailing me saying, can you check what I've done? Can you check what I've done? And I'm, I, I, I decline. I said, no. I said, I want you to tell me what you think it means. And then we're going to discuss it. We're here to learn. All the students have to read all the documents and we're here to do this. And they only have no more than four minutes to give the presentation because I want them to focus on four key things. One is if it's a plot uh, applicable, which it is for a lot of these you see on the screen, who is the author? So if you look at the first one, which is the one I want to talk about, you know, Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois, two very famous civil rights leaders to people who know about civil rights history. But to a lot of our students, they may not know who these people are, but who they are is profoundly important for what this document holds because they're of two different generations of people. They have different views on civil rights. Yes, they're all fighting for the same goal, but they have very different approaches and very different thoughts. So I, may, I want them to find out a little bit about who these people are. And it's, some of it's included in the documents. When you go to the document itself, you'll see that it's, there's a little bit here in the beginning, but it's not very much. So I asked, I asked them to find out who these people are. And then I asked them to look at sort of the context of the writing. And this is something that they have a lot of trouble with. And that means, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a citation at the bottom of the documents oftentimes of where this comes from. But I want them to, I, I want, I'm asking them, and they get this some through, the, through textbook reading and through lecture of what the debate is. And so that's the context I'm trying to get them to, to focus on. Then the third thing is I want them to read the, the document very carefully. These are very short. These are not very long, typically in these in, in different uh, formats. And so I want them to look at the words. I mean, because the words have a different meaning than our own time. And so I want them to look very carefully at this and to put, pick out anything that doesn't make any sense to them. What is this that you don't understand more than what you understand? And I want them to ask that question in their presentation. I understand A, B, and C, but I don't understand D, E, and F. That's what I'm trying to get them to actually say in the presentation. And most students will do this. And then the last part of it is, is where I want them to say, like in this one, for example, um, it, it, you know, this is, these, these two documents, one by Washington and one by Du Bois, were written in 1895 and 1903. When you read these documents, you might think they were written more recently, right? And so I try to get them to apply a lot of these things uh, that they're reading about to the world we live in. In some ways, kind of like Lisi talked about in her presentation is, you know, what does this do in our world? Are these words things that we still talk about? And why are we still talking about these things? That's my own frustration, Never mind. But that's, you know, the, well, why are we still talking about these same things that people were talking about 50 years ago or 100 years ago, or in some classes, 500 years ago? Why are these, some, and these things still come up? And so that's why I try to get, try to get them to focus on is sort of what it means in its own time, but then also how it applies to ourselves. And so the grading is very simple. Like I said, if you show up on the day that you're assigned and that if you are, and if you show evidence you prepare the assignment, then you get the points. It's not worth a lot of points in my class. Um, if they do two of these, it might be worth up to 5% of the whole class grade. So it's not a huge amount, but it's sort of easy points in a way. They, and, they, and students actually tend to like it. Once it gets going, they tend to, they tend to like it and it, and it's a relief for my voice. It's a relief for my talking uh, on Zoom or in the classroom when we're doing it there. And they tend to actually, when they actually hear someone else give a three or four minute presentation, they actually do tend to look at each other more because that person has said more than, you know, I agree with you or I don't like this and this was weird, sort of offhand comments. Somebody gave a substantive presentation. And so when the questions come up, at least in the classroom, it was this way, they were actually looking at each other physically in the room. And what I've seen online is that more students will turn on their cameras. 
that they will more to have this kind of discussion once other students have you know <laughs> broken that zoom wall and allowed themselves to actually talk to us for four minutes about something they knew probably nothing about but now are in many ways the master of it and my goal in that is is to say as little as possible um, is to say as little as possible and allow them to have the conversation even if it drifts off of what it's supposed to be even if there are mistakes that are made i wait as long as i possibly can to come in and sort of correct the mistakes which i can't not do and then but but and then if the conversation seems totally off course then i i will pull it back but I let it go in some ways. And that is always um, an interesting experiment to do because it not, it's not always friendly. Um, it's not always a friendly conversation. It, it, can, be, it can become tense. And, um, but I think there's something productive in that. I don't mean disrespectful, but there's something productive in people sort of exploring things that they hadn't explored before. And you might think a document from you know, 1895 and 1903 would not necessarily spark current emotions or current thoughts, but especially in teaching more recent US history, this is constant. And it's not simply about, these are about race, uh, these documents here, but it's about um, economics, it's about so class, it's about all kinds of things that we don't, you know, we see in our culture happening all the time today. And in, I think in this, in this chapter alone, you can look back at all these documents. Um, Jane Addams is, you know, talking about settlement houses and Debs is talking about why he's a socialist and, and other people here about things, you know, women's, women's rights and and um, nationalism, these are all things that are still pre you know, prevalent in our world today, but they have a short and a long history to them that I try to focus on and emphasize uh, by using these documents, getting them to look at you know, three paragraphs in order to sort of see the bigger picture. So that's my little example that I wanted to bring to you all today of something I do in, in this VCM format that I brought, from, I brought from the classroom and converted into this way, so thanks. Ben, thank you. That was great. Um, and I actually think given the emphasis you put on rhetorical analysis that you would have made a fine English professor in another lifetime. So, um, my, my, my mom taught English for a long time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to, if it's okay, I'm actually going to try and um, put the first question to the committee out there. Um, and I find it, um, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that all three of you talked about, um, you know, what Don talked about is the dialogic process getting students to talk to one another, to not look at the whiteboard or the professor, but to engage. And it's kind of one of the results of this that I'm, uh, that sort of percolated of the, doing these panels is last week we had the NHS division and they didn't seem as concerned as having students engage with one another in an online setting like the way that liberal arts um, clearly has here. Um, you know, and their, their fields are understandably a lot more hands-on where they're working with. We had um, someone from surgical, surgical technology, respiratory care and nursing. And so they're getting their students to work with their hands using tools. Um, it's not like, it's not that discussion isn't important to them, but I mean, it seems like it's uh, pr certainly privileged in liberal arts classes. So I'm wondering if you guys can address how you get students to engage with one another, maybe in a asynchronous setting. Because one of my challenges, one of the challenges that I've had with a lot of other colleagues that I talk to in liberal arts is, and I referenced this last week, is that the dreaded discussion board, it's, um, it's old timey, it feels forced. You're kind of, when you put rules and restrictions in there, you tell a student you have to post, you have to respond to. And it just seems like students do that um, just to check the box instead of actually engaging and talking with one another. So I'm wondering if the three of you um, can address some of the ways in which you get your students to sort of come out of their shell in an online setting. I mean, I'll be honest, when, when Lissy gave her presentation and she showed that video of the students dancing in the atrium, it broke my heart a little bit because in an on, in an on campus situation, it's easy to get students to sort of collaborate and um, work with one another, talk with one another. It's harder in an online setting, less hard in a VCM, but certainly the asynchronous setting is challenging. So how do you guys sort of, um, you know, fight that in your classes? Well, uh, I'll, I'll start, I guess. I mean, one of the things, well, I, I will take issue to him with something you said. Using primary sources for a historian is hands-on learning. That is, I mean, that's, that's what historians do. Historians go to archives. And so this is a very small example of that. And so it is the hands-on sort of aspect in many ways of what historians do, not reading a textbook. Historians don't read textbooks. Uh, they, they barely even write them. 
um, they, um, but, but it is what we do. But I would say for what I do with the VCM, which I did in the classroom too, is I would always, against the advice of all my professors I had a thousand years ago, I always show up early to class. And I show up early to class so I can talk to the students just about nothing. And so I do it on Zoom too. So I, my class starts at 9.30, I open the Zoom at 9.15 and I'm there to, and I try very hard to talk about nothing, uh, nothing important, nothing about the class. I ask them about other things and I ask them how things are going. And I think that that awkward at times, chit chatty kind of conversation about, you know, whatever it is that's happening that day um, helps them feel more comfortable with me, somebody that they've never met in person Right. I have a few students I had when we were still in person, but, you know, I don't know a lot of these students. And so it's a way they get they, they sort of feel more comfortable because my own two. And this, the reason why I say this is it has to do with my own two children who are both out of college. And um, they both told me as they were going through college, they always felt very intimidated by professors. And I laughed at that because, you know, I know a lot of you and you know, <laughs> but they're intimidated. There's an intimidation. Right. And I think that that's what I was trying, you know, to break down. And I did in the classroom, I think, eat more easily because I kind of wander in and I'd be shuffling papers. And I'd make sort of offhand comments on Zoom. It's much more awkward, but it sort of works if you just sort of allow them to chit chat about whatever's going on. And so my most recent thing was, you know, I hope you're getting your vaccine. So, <laughs> so that's my little part. So. Um. So for Spanish or for languages in general, we've actually been teaching synchronously for about 13, 14 years now. Um, so we don't have asynchronous classes. So that's kind of a hard question for me to answer. But what I could answer is how do we get our students speaking? I teach via the communicative approach, a task-based approach. So I'm only speaking about 10, 15% of the class. And the students are speaking for the rest of the class. Um, so they're completing tasks. And I choose tasks that spark conversation are interesting to them. So some examples are if we talk about family, they pick pictures of their family, hold it up to the webcam, talk about their family, their dogs, they bring their dog on webcam. <laughs> so it, it, they get engaged in that. Or in the first weeks of Spanish, we're learning how to express what they like with me gusta. And I ask them to show us symbols or images of or actual objects of what they like. I have a student that really loves reading the Bible and she showed her Bible on webcam. I have another student that loves video games and she showed a video game that she likes to play. And then that sparks conversation with them. So like they're into it. They want to talk about these things because they're sharing their likes, dislikes, and then they're learning from the other students what they like and don't like. So I just try to um, and what, what I showed in the presentation with the social media, it's just, they have an opinion. They want to talk about it. They're into it. So I just try to choose, um, topics that will spark discussion and where, um, students can actually share their opinion or parts of their lives. Um, and that usually helps. Um, so I'm, I'm the one who had to, had to do this asynchronously. And I have to say, this is the thing I struggle with the most. So what I did in, in this class is I did not want the thing where you tell students to write a post that's a certain length and then everybody has to reply to two other posts. And like, that was really great. Like, I don't, um, and so I told them, I, I, I like refused to give them those kinds of objective criteria. And instead what I said is, I want you to have a conversation. I will be grading you on whether <laughs> you participated in a way that contributed to a productive actual conversation. So if that means you post something that sparks a discussion, that's good. If you don't post something that sparks a discussion, but you contributed in an interesting way to, to a discussion somebody else started, that's also fine. So like, there's not like one rule, but I want it to look like actual engagement. Um, so I think that helped a little. I think I saw more actual engagement than in the traditional setup. Um, it, it, but it wasn't amazing. Um, it was it was still not amazing. So I think, yeah, it's just really hard. The whole discussion board thing, getting genuine engagement in an asynchronous class is really hard. What I did, I think helped a little, but yeah, I, I don't have a magic bullet. S silver bullet, whatever. 
I actually, I'd like to call everyone's attention to a link that Lara just posted in the uh, chat, which is really, really helpful. And I didn't even realize that you guys had published. It's what, two days old um, on the faculty professional development website it has a lot of resources for trying to facilitate um, online discussions in sort of new and unique um, ways. So I would uh, encourage all of you to take a look at that or bookmark it for a later read. So um, do we have any questions from the audience? Is there anything that the audience would like to ask of the panelists or are there any um, comments that any of you would like to make? Uh, Juliana, you're muted, but go ahead. Yep. Oh, hold on, Juliana. You're still yeah, muted. Start over. Was, there you go. I got the message. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I got thrust into online asynchronous this semester by volunteering to fill in for another professor. And that's been entertaining, stepping in kind of almost halfway through the semester. But the students have been supportive and like, like me providing any structure, which seemed to be lacking before. Um, but I guess that big question about having an asynchronous community when they communicate with me email call me actually and talk and text they say how much they would love to have a community feeling in the class and they're all like i wish i just signed up for a synchronous class and like you know i'm like yes you i wish so too but you didn't so <laughs> let's work with what we have so the one thing i've done to get them to more be more participatory in the discussion boards that has kind of worked is i'll post questions about the textbook they're using and primary sources i assign to them but then one of the things I do is each week, one of the questions I post will be like, post a Twitter update, post, I should include TikTok videos now about like, you know, you're in the Crimean War, what are you experiencing? Or, you know, the war, World War One just ended, how are you gonna celebrate? And like, and that they'll respond to each other a lot about if you kind of take it out of the history question and answer game completely. So, and that's the only way I've gotten them to be really discursive and feel more engaged, I guess, so. A, a historical discussion always seems to work for history class. <laughs> so those are my ideas. Uh, thank you. Amelia, did I see a hand up? You have a question, comment? Well, I'm just, um, and I, it's no comment on my colleagues because I had my um, camera off too. But um, uh, what I'm finding really frustrating is, and I don't want to point out my students, for instance, I know for a fact that one of my students is homeless. So I, I, I can't require them, obviously, to turn their cameras on. Um, but I do really need some feedback and interaction visually. And I'm, uh, I find it like talking into a void when it's, um, you know, just these black boxes and I, I can't figure out exactly what to do. Mm, I do listening comprehension checks after like three, four or five minutes of anything I discuss and get their feedback and, well, what do you think? Or is it this or this? Or just to make sure they're paying attention. So I know I'm not looking into a void. And then I only require them to turn on their webcams when we do small group work so they could feel at ease. Um, so I don't know, that that kind of helps just to kind of keep them engaged. I, I just add in comprehension checks, comprehension checks. Um, and sometimes I ask them to say it on the mic. Sometimes I ask them to type it in the chat. So that's maybe something you could do. I am. Um, I find I don't have this problem. I'm fine speaking into a void. Um, and but, although I do, I do what Lisa says, and, and I use um, like polls to check. So like normally I would gauge whether they're getting it by watching their faces. I use polls now. Um, but one, one suggestion I saw online was a, a professor who said, look, I just find that if nobody has their camera on, I do a bad job of teaching. And just sat down and like told the students that. So like, I have this problem. I can't teach you well if I don't see anybody's faces. And my experience is that if like 60% of the class has their, their camera on, I'll be fine. So what can we do? And, and, and what this, this professor said was that after explaining that to the students, they kind of like sympathized and they wanted to help them out. And so then, you know, some of them would leave their cameras off, but like, you know, if they didn't mind too much, they would try to leave it on. So, you know, I mean, you could try that. <laughs> I thought it was a good idea. You know what I've been surprised about in this, this little, you know, social experiment of the pandemic we've been going through is that, um, the engagement classes is from last spring. Well, last spring was different because we left classes that we knew. It, was a little bit, it had a different dynamic to it. And there was kind of a panic and, and people sort of 
I, it, actually, those students I, I found did pretty well. They hung on and did pretty well. Summer was sort of normal in a way, but this year um, with these synchronous classes that we've been doing, I've noticed a kind of similar pattern to what was already kind of existing. And that is uh, classes have their own personalities and they sort of develop their own kind of ability to engage or not. Um, sometimes regardless of what I try, I mean, like I'll give you an example right now, I'm teaching a history of terrorism class, which you think would be a compelling in class of discussion. It is zero. It is a painful experience. I don't think I've ever had such an experience, but about six years ago, I had a similar experience in the same class, history of terrorism, where they all sat stone faced and looked at me as if there was nothing to talk about. And I, so I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's the camera. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's the group that walked in or registered. And so I, I think it's, these things vary uh, sometimes out of our control. Um, there's a dynamic within the group that happens to click that button to sign up for the class sometimes. So that doesn't help much, but I think that's part of what I've experienced. I would also suggest just, it doesn't mean they're not getting it if they're not talking. Like I know that in some of my fall classes, like had the sort of Zoom experience that a lot of people are describing where like, boy, it's just me and a bunch of names and <laughs> this is just, is this a monologue? But then like you read their assignments and it's like, okay, you got it, you know? So it, it's sort of engagement is nice, obviously for us because it acts as a kind of reinforcement to what we're doing in an immediate way. But I guess I've come to question whether I should trust it as an accurate measure of whether they're actually learning what they're, they're supposed to be. Because I don't know, like when they get to their, their writing assignments, a, a, a quiet class that doesn't speak in, in conversation and in group discussion, they looked pretty good. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes. Barb, did you want to weigh in or ask a question? Um, yeah, and I mentioned this in another um, forum that we did. One of the things that I found was dramatically helpful after this pandemic was um, normally, you know, we all meet face to face in a large group for some of our labs for um, constructing projects, putting them together. And what I did is hygiene, dental hygiene has. A, you know, it's not like they can take one class at any time. It's like one class at that time. So pretty much everybody is used to that situation. So we have that advantage. And basically we all kind of did it um, more a synchronized class. And ultimately what I had is I would have those students um, through Zoom meeting in breakout rooms. So it would be four or five students. And the fun part about it was that I would jump from room to room and I could literally hear them engaging. Mm. And then they would come back to the group and they'd have more to say. It was, you know, like, you know, we've tried that a million times in regular, in, during our regular teaching experience. But for some reason, it seemed like they were more focused and could present really concise and very, very good views when it came to their information. I mean, that was one really good thing that I, I found from the, um, from the, uh, uh, from this event. So I'm literally thinking about using a portion of their lab, even when we're face to face in that same kind of situation, because it was very, very successful. They stayed on task. It was no excessive noise. And, you know, the other thing, when somebody was talking about, talking about uh, coming in early, and talking to the students about other things, I thought if they had their camera on and you could, you know, read their expressions and stuff like that, we had a lot of good just getting to know you kind of comments at the beginning of class or whenever we'd have a break or something like that. So I, I didn't feel that that was so bad. And one group of students I had known in class and one group of students I didn't know at all. And I do feel, I was worried about this and I do feel some connection with them and I will have them now um, 
I, I have them now and then I'll have them in the summer and then all next year. So that's one thing that I found was surprising and something that also worked for me. Juliana, did you want to jump in again? Or is your hand still up? Yeah, so I, I, it's still up now. Sorry for bringing up two things in one discussion, but um, thank you, Barb, for bringing up the small group discussions. And that's something that I'd gotten in the habit of using a lot in my face-to-face -face classes, just to have them all focus on primary sources and me kind of walk around the room, like interrupting them and asking them questions. So it's been harder for me to get used to doing that online, especially through Blackboard Collaborate. In my class, I use Zoom is no problem, but I still, it's difficult to get used to that on a blackboard so but so on the idea of engagement i used to say to, to them and on my syllabus that i graded participation and i finally just gave up it was like it's engagement you can do anything and that will count as engagement so the kids kids my kids who are might be 30 and 40s as long as they show me that they are engaged actively whether it's communicating with each other or me sending images, sending memes, making memes. That's hilarious when you have students in a class make memes to fit some primary source we're discussing because they'll come up with hilarious, sometimes offensive things, which is awesome. Because I'm like, you know, just express whatever you're feeling when you look at this thing and you can do whatever you want with pixels, nothing's permanent. So, you know, and that's how, you know, make them, remind them that the ephemeral nature of our new classes online is all the room in the world then to express yourself without worrying about it meaning anything besides what you want it to mean. So hopefully that makes them feel a bit more empowered in our digital reality these days. So that's what I do. I would just like to agree with uh, what Brian said when we were talking about the engagement part, like this class that I was having trouble with, is that the engagement was what I was having trouble with. And they're not responding a lot, mm -hmm. but their work, I, I agree with you, their work often doesn't reflect that. I mean, their work actually, you know, can often be very good. Um, and and it, it may actually be an argument for sort of, you know, quiet reflection <laughs> sometimes then I mean that they don't have to necessarily respond to me um I just think that because of what we do and the way we've always done it is that you know we almost it, it we feed off of it when you stand in front of a classroom for 20 something years you you expect people to have some reaction good or bad or indifferent and when you see black boxes you're just sort of get frozen sometimes and that's I think I don't think I, I don't I don't find myself getting frozen I actually find myself sort of losing my own train of thought Mm -hmm. um because i'm not getting any kind like right now i'm talking to you and several of you are nodding and some of you are frowning and some of you are looking at your phones and that's a, that's what people do right and so and that's a normal sort of conversation and that's the black boxes are hard for us but like like brian said their work can be actually quite good and so i agree with that so i am you know going back to that idea that like different groups of students have different sort of personalities or different cultures like I do feel like that is maybe a bit more extreme in the VCM era than normal. Like it's always been true that, you know, something that works in one class might not work in another, but you have less ability to sort of socially pressure them now than you have in person. <laughs> um, uh, so like what I've ended up doing is that I have like maybe three or four different ways I can do the same thing. So like for cases where I really do need engagement, um, in some classes, I have them get into small groups. In some classes, it's just a whole class discussion. In some classes, maybe I just ask tons of polls. And in some classes, maybe I have them write in on um, like Google documents. And the thing is like different things will work. Well. Like, in, like I have one class where like they love small groups. They like stage a revolution or like stop interrupting us only four minutes in. We were just getting started. We were just getting to the good part. And they like want small groups. And I can tell that they're having amazing discussions. And then another class teaching the exact same content, they're like, no, stop making us do small groups. And they just want to have the whole class. And so you just got to like try everything and find the one that works for that group. Um, and th that has helped a little bit to, to get around some of the problems. Uh, Edward, do you have your hand up? You have a question? Yeah, well, I uh, comment on asynchronous. Um, the the history uh, folks on this know me as uh, the person who has put together most of the uh, uh, survey shells for uh, uh, history classes. And uh, uh, <laughs> I will say that I am Mr. Rule uh, because on the discussion board, because I do have all kinds of rules something that was uh, discussed before. I mean, I, I do find that the students who 
engaged the best, for instance, in doing the replies are those that are the most engaged in the class, quite frankly, uh, in other areas of the class, not just in the discussion board. So it does kind of work, but I, I will say it is, it is an ongoing uh, uh, frustration, but I think forums like this are what's so helpful because I'm jotting down all kinds of ideas. So what is really good is when you do have the shells like this is to give feedback to whomever is do putting the shells together so that we can improve them and make them better. That's been one of my biggest frustrations. Uh, Dolores is one of the few that gets back to me that tells me what she thinks about something. But, uh, uh, you know, a, a forum like this, I mean, I even set up these classes so there's a place for other instructors to put things in there and say, hey, this worked, this didn't, because they're shells. The expectation is I've set up a format. Now you take it into your own class and make it work for you. But tell me what worked and what didn't work so that we can make them better for everybody. That's my two cents for the day. Thank you, Edward. That was a good comment. Do we have any others? Sarah, I think I see a hand up. Hold on, you're muted. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, I just um again like um like I have like a class right now where it's just I have some of those students that they're relatively quiet. If I ask them a question, they'll answer. And they're clearly paying attention and they're producing really good work. And I also have students that just, um, I think the only thing I can figure out is that they're logging, like they're joining the session and then eventually they go inactive and like, like at multiple times, you can't get them to respond by typing or speaking. And it's just, it's, it's, it's very clear that essentially it's like coming to class and falling asleep. So like, even if I type something like, hey, are you there? Um, and like, part of me wants to throw my hands up in the air and just be like, you know, like, like, but like, what, what, you know, like, what can I do, you know? Um, but it's just, it makes too big of an impact on the class. It's just like, I, I have a, I have like, there's like two students that as long as they're there, everything's okay. But if they can't be there or if they're quiet that day, just no one else will talk. And so one of the ways that I found to, to help that out uh, in my VCM courses that I've taught, and a couple of them have been honors, so maybe I've been lucky, but um, I've been teaching online since 2008 and tried lots of different formats and things. Um, one suggestion I have for you, Sarah, is that you make participation a part of their grade. It so is. You tell, yeah, well, I mean, it, and maybe it's not a significant enough part of the grade. So in a lot of my classes, participation can count for more than 20% of the overall grade. If that's something that I want them to be doing, I make it very worthwhile for them. And I still will end up in a class of 25 with about two or three students who never say anything. But usually what ends up happening by having participation be so much of their grade, they are um, sort of climbing all over each other, <laughs> trying to get themselves heard and, and, and speak. And one of the requirements I also make is that they have to reference the readings for that day's discussion. So they have to cite the material. Um, so I, I have it sort of tiered. So if you say something contributing, asking a question or offering an opinion, that's worth about 60% of the points. So that's just passing. And if you cite the text or reference the text in specific ways, that's 100% of the credit for the day. And I, I tend to do it in uh, a way, so if it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, I tell them that they have to participate at least two out of the three course meetings. So that gives them an out if they're not feeling well or they don't wanna come to class or they're not feeling up to participating, they have one day per week where they can just not participate. But I found by making participation more than just like, you know, 5% or 10% of their overall score, by making it 20 or 30%, you will get students participating. Um, 
it, it actually becomes difficult then to try and get everybody gets a, a, a turn. But I think you have to kind of stick to your guns, especially if you set that out there and you say, this yeah. is how you're going to be graded. What I have stick found to myself doing is in addition to like sending them emails, just like, you know, saying like, oh, you know, like you seemed a little distracted. Let me know, like, if there's anything I can help you with, you know, la da da. But um, I've just, you know, um, my attendance thing, I just, I make a note, like, and it's annoying, like while you're trying to teach, but like there's like a little beep and stuff. It's like, I just like, I can make a note that's when someone has basically like left the class and that way, like, and when they, and, but, um, you know, and, you know, I've told them how that participation counts and, you know, but um, I was thinking about like how uh, someone was saying about how like building those um, the course shells and they wanna know what works um, I recently for my VCM class, I, I basically made them sign up for like a, a what's it called? Like a, like a, like an office hour, like a conference with me. Like, you know, to like discuss, you know, one of a couple things. And in that, what I did, it, not every, but, but I did find that a lot of the students, I asked them like, like something about like, you know, what, what they think, how it would help them, would help like ensure their success in the class. And, you know, and like they offer forth ideas, not all of them are realistic or can be done, but at least being heard seems to have helped. But like, so I'm, I'm hoping that that helps, but you know, it's like, you know, a bunch of students say that the issue about knowing you, about people not using their cameras and I still can't get those students to use their cameras. So, but yeah. One thing but you might I, consider doing is reaching out to- Students, like, I know it's not like, I know it sounds like pandering, but more of like, like, what do you think of this learning environment? Like, and, you know, and like, they'll let me know things like, I, I don't have a super organized um, module by week. Um, like I have like announcements of their homework for the next class. And like, I, like I changed the way I listed it. I would put like the first couple words, like carefully read or complete and submit, I put those in bold. And more than one, uh, like two different students mentioned how they found that helpful. And I was like, really? Okay. So, I mean, sometimes like, you know, having like, if you have an opportunity to like talk about like some like assignments or something, but just like, you know, ask them like, like what, what, what they think is, is, is helpful and, you know, but again, I mean, a lot of it's not even, is not really realistic and doable, but you know, some of it actually, I like didn't realize that they were having problem with, with, with locating things. So yeah, that's just. I'm going to put Jen Kelly and Laura Tompkins on call here because they might be able to uh, help you or at least point you in the right direction to find resources to try and get more and more students sort of out of their shells. Um, learning tech, I mean, like Laura was like lightning fast today at like providing us resources. Whenever one of the panelists would reference something, um, you know, Laura's there to provide a resource. So Sarah, you might reach out to learning the learning tech office. Yeah, you know, yeah. That might not yeah. necessarily be technology, but I think that is, they have a ton of resources to be able to help look for innovative ways to do that. So um, yeah. Ben has a question. I do want to point out, so we've been going for yeah. about 70 minutes. Usually these last about 60. We have until 4.30, but I also want to be um, respectful of all of your uh, time, especially the panelists. So Ben, do you want to pipe in? Yeah, I was just thinking about something I do in my class now that um, actually is kind of an effective thing. And it's kind of a strange little story. So let me just give you, it's a strange thing about participation from students. So last semester, I taught a US history survey class, very typical sort of class. And there was a woman in the class who I got to know in those little pre-class chats. And we figured out that she and I were about the same age. And she had living at home with her several children ranging in age from 25 down to eight, I think, or so, something like this. 
and, it, and it's a it's a horrible story, but it's a pot. It's an it, it works with students. So she's she has these children at home, and some she would always have her camera on no matter what. And so she's braiding her daughter's hair um, at nine thirty in the morning on a Tuesday Thursday class. And the horrible part of the story is her twenty five year old son was dying of some horrible disease. That's why he was home. So it's a, it's a terrible story. But one day in class, this woman is on her phone participating in class at 9.30 in the morning with her mother while they are shopping at Costco. And she is the most participatory student in the class. She is answering everything that I'm asking about slavery. What, I don't know what we're talking about. I got so distracted by Costco, I couldn't even tell you what she was talking about, what, what we're talking about. And she's going through this, but, she, but the camera angle was weird because it was sort of her face and then the, the ceiling of, of Costco. So it was obviously in a cart looking up at the ceiling. And so finally I asked her about 20 minutes in, I said, where are you? And she goes, oh, I'm sorry my camera's so bumpy for people because like a couple days before this, she had broken her ankle in a parking lot when she had to take her son to the hospital for some treatment. And so my story to my students now is, I tell this story to the, in the beginning of class in a general way, if she can do this, we all can do this because I was just perplexed by her, the problems. And she did fine, like she did very well in the class, but every class she was there, the camera was always on and she was always participating. And she made that class 100% better. And I use that example and I probably use it forever um, for the rest of the time that I teach as an example of someone who persevered through some really awful things um, in order to make it work. And it helped my class, it helped my class. And I was appreciative, I was appreciative of that, so. Um, yeah, um, I had a teacher in college who showed up on the first day, said that he was, he had been up all night, had just driven in for, from like, from like a four hour drive and he was still drunk from the night before and he was there and that's what he expected from all of us. <laughs> that's it. All right, on that note, <laughs> um, do we have it's any o'clock, right, Tim? questions for the panelists? All right, I I am all like this conversation leaves me really energized. Um, I think this was uh, incredibly insightful. I think it was you guys provided some great tools, some great tricks, um, and even in this. Like I said, I was sort of lamenting the fact that Lissy showed this video of students gathering on campus, you know, but like one of the weird benefits of being in this, you know, pandemic world is that we can get 35 people from liberal arts and other areas together to spend an hour and 15 minutes talking about this stuff. So um, I want to thank all of you for coming today. I especially want to thank Ben, Don, and Lissy for um, volunteering to present. You guys were fantastic. Um, if any of you are, were energized by this conversation, you want to hear more, we're having another one tomorrow at one o'clock featuring the ACH division. It'll be Jude Geiger, um, Kathy Baum, and uh, Gautam Wadwa. Um, and so uh, I encourage you to look in Cornerstone to join us um, if you want. Otherwise, without further ado, thanks to all. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to sign off. I want you to all have a great uh, rest of your day, and um, we'll see you guys around the corner, I hope. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.